Hello, and welcome to a lecture on uniform plane waves in lossless media. My name is Steve Ellingson. The structure of this uh, lecture is as follows. First, I'll remind you about the wave equations for the electric and magnetic fields. Uh, I'll discuss the uniform plane wave solution to those wave equations. I'll discuss the relationship between the electric and magnetic fields from Maxwell's equations. We'll talk about the wave impedance. Then we'll return to this issue of the relationship between E and H, but now from Poynting's theorem, which talks about power transfer. Then finally, we'll culminate in a discussion of the plane wave relationship, which is the principal result from uh, this lecture. Then finally, I'll wrap up by talking about why we are concerned about uniform plane waves, uh, in what way they are useful for uh, engineering electromagnetic analysis. Okay, first, the wave equation. The differential equations for the electric and magnetic fields in unbounded, source-free media are easily derived from Maxwell's equations, and here they are. This is the wave equation for E and the wave equation for H. So let me just remind you here, the electric field E is in units of volts per meter. The magnetic field H is in units of amps per meter. And K is a wave number, and that has units of radians per meter. These equations are easily solved if we add the constraint that magnitude and phase must be constant over a plane. And this is the definition of a uniform plane wave. In other words, we take the equations and we also add the constraint, which you can think of as playing the role of a boundary condition in some sense, that the magnitude and the phase of the solution must be constant over a plane. So without loss of generality, let us say that the plane of interest is perpendicular to a Cartesian axis, which we will identify as S. So in other words, here is an axis uh, in a coordinate system, and we'll give it the, the name S. Now S could be the X coordinate, or it could be the Y coordinate, or the Z coordinate, or some other uh, linear uh, Cartesian direction. Uh, but just to be ge as general as possible, we'll just call it S. The most general solution under this constraint that the magnitude and phase must be constant over a plane is this. Here is a solution for the electric field. Here is a solution for the magnetic field. Uh, in general, uh, what you see is the sum of two terms. So, for example, for the electric field, we have this term here and this term here. The first term has a minus sign in the exponent, and we know that that corresponds to waves traveling in the plus s direction. The second term has a plus sign in the exponent of the, uh, the second term here, and we know that corresponds to a wave traveling in the uh, minus s direction. So these are waves traveling uh, both forward and backward. These coefficients, e naught, with either a plus or a minus sign as a superscript, uh, are simply complex coefficients, complex valued coefficients. Uh, and out front here, we have these unit vectors. Now, so far, we have no basis for which to determine uh, what these unit vectors are. We simply know that they must be oriented in some direction in space. Now, without loss of generality, we can narrow our focus to the fields propagating in just the plus s direction. Uh, in other words, just this wave, uh, this just this wave, just this wave here. The reason we say there's no loss of generality is because we know the only thing that changes is uh, a conjugate. If we conjugate these results, then we get the wave traveling in the opposite direction. And by superposition, then we know we can um, construct more general solutions uh, as, as necessary. So now the relationship between E and H. We have this problem that we know E and H solve the same equation, so we get very similar looking results. Uh, so we'd like to figure out in what way E and H uh, are related. The relationship between them can be found by substituting the expressions that we showed on the previous slide back into Maxwell's equations. After all, Maxwell's equations is a starting point for all of this analysis. So uh, the use of those equations should reveal in the way in which E and H are related. A good starting point would be the Maxwell-Faraday equation, 
and also Ampere's equation as shown here. Now, this is a source-free region, so we're going to get rid of uh, J because uh, J represents uh, current sources. If we do this, if we take the result that we derived on the previous slide and we plug it back into Maxwell's equations, we can generate three results uh, relatively quickly. Uh, I'm not going to go through the math for each one of those results. I'm simply going to say what they are, but any good textbook in electromagnetics will walk you through the details. I just want to show you the results. The first result is that E and H must be perpendicular to each other. So if you plug in uh, the solutions we showed on the previous slide, it becomes obvious that the only way this works is if E and H, uh, the vectors, are perpendicular to each other. The second thing you find by following through on this exercise is that E and H, these vectors, uh, as identified in the previous slide, E hat and H hat, must be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So both E, the vector, and H, the vector, must be perpendicular to the s-axis. The third result is that you find that the ratio of the magnitude of the electric to the magnetic fields is a constant, and this constant is given by constitutive parameters. We call it the wave impedance. I give it the symbol eta, and it's equal to the square root of the permeability to the permittivity. Next, we'd like to invoke the pointing theorem. Now, the pointing theorem is something that you have undoubtedly encountered in an undergraduate course in electromagnetics. Pointing's theorem is an expression of the conservation of power and energy straightforwardly derived from Maxwell's equation. What we're really interested in here, though, is a corollary to the theorem, which gives the power density. And by this, I mean uh, po uh, watts per meter squared, power with uh, per unit uh, area, and the direction of power flow at a point. So the quantity that relates these things is known as the pointing vector. And this is one way in which you can describe the pointing vector. Uh, what we say is that the pointing vector, which is really the time average power, hence the subscript there, is one half the real part of the cross product of E and H, and you take the conjugate of H before you take the real part. I should warn you that this is uh, for field quantities expressed in peak, uh, not RMS units. So we're talking about volts per meter and amps per meter here, not volts uh, RMS and amps RMS. So just keep that in mind. If you are doing RMS units, that's fine, but this factor of two would uh, go away. In the case of the plus S traveling uniform plane wave that we uh, considered in the previous slide, uh, if we take that result and we plug it back into this uh, equation for the pointing vector, we find that the time average power uh, and the direction in which it flows is given by this expression. So this is the uh, leading coefficient uh, for that description of the plane wave. Uh, and this is the direction in which uh, the power is flowing. So let's just break this down in a little bit more detail. We have the magnitude part, which is immediately recognizable as having the correct units. Uh, volts per meter squared gives you volts squared over meters squared. Divide by an impedance, you get watts per meter squared. That all makes sense. And again, this two would be, uh, would be removed if we were doing this in RMS units as opposed to peak units. The quantity E cross H gives us the direction of propagation. And what we now know is that the power flow, the direction of power flow, is in the direction of propagation. In other words, previously we've determined that E and H were both perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Relating this to the pointing vector now tells us that the same direction is the direction of power flow. So here's the picture we now have. We have E and H. They're both perpendicular to each other. They're both perpendicular to the direction of propagation and the power flows in the direction of propagation and the power density in the direction of propagation is given by this quantity. So that's a complete picture. We can summarize this in three equations which are collectively known as the plane wave relationships. Again, same picture here, but the plane wave relationships say that if you want H, you can get it from the direction of propagation and the electric field as follows. S uh, cross E gives you the right vector that points in the H direction. 
and you simply divide by the impedance to get the magnetic field intensity. Similarly, you can get H if you already know the direction of propagation because H cross S gives you a vector in the E direction uh, and you just multiply by the impedance to get the right units. So H and E are, are simply related. And then finally, as we just explained, the power density is given by this expression. So what's the point of all this? Well, strictly speaking, we never see uniform plane waves. Let me repeat that. We never see uniform plane waves. This is because all practical sources are limited in spatial extent. What do I mean by that? To generate a perfect plane wave, we would need a current distribution, which existed over a sheet, because that's what it would take to generate a plane wave, which propagated in some direction. And that sheet would have to go off to infinity in every direction. So obviously we never see structures like that where current densities extend to infinity in all direction and therefore we never see uniform plane waves. Any source which is finite gives rise to waves which are better represented as spherical waves. So if you have some chunk of current here, it's finite in extent. At some distance away, it's going to look more like a spherical wave radiating away from that finite uh, distribution of current. However, uh, there is this very nice feature uh, where most waves can be described as being locally planar. What do I mean by that? If you get far enough from a finite source, then the curvature of the wave fronts becomes very small. So if I have some chunk of current here, maybe that's an antenna of some kind, uh, and I get far enough away from it, well, globally, from a global perspective, I'm generating a spherical wave. However, if I look at just a small piece of it, maybe this piece right here, within that radial extent, it is a very good approximation to a uniform plane wave. So, uh, as I've said here, it's an excellent approximation to say the wave front becomes locally planar that is representable as uniform plane waves over some region in space. Electromagnetic problems can get pretty complicated, so we're highly motivated to exploit this approximation whenever it occurs. Far easier to deal with uh, plane waves than it is with spherical waves or cylindrical waves or other general kinds of wave fronts. There's another reason why we might consider uh, or why we frequently consider uniform plane waves. It has to do with superposition. Lots of waves that we encounter in practice can be described as superpositions of plane waves. So for example, in wireless propagation characterization, we have this thing called a two-ray model, where for example, maybe we have an antenna, um, and then we have another antenna some distance away, and we, e even though the first antenna generates a spherical wave in principle, because of the local planar approximation, it looks like a plane wave by the time it gets to the source. And similarly, we might have a ground bounce component where the same thing happens. So what the source, what the uh, distant end ends up seeing is uh, an ex to an excellent approximation is two plane waves. A second way that plane wave superposition comes into play, and um, this is more of an advanced topic, is that it turns out that any kind of wave front, you can draw a wave front that's decidedly non-planar in various and all kinds of ways, can still be represented as a superposition of plane waves. So here's, for example, three plane waves which might be interfering with each other in such a way to create this, this wave front. Uh, and uh, this leads to a very powerful mathematical technique because the principal component is a plane wave, and those are easy to deal with. And then all we have to do is add them up in the right way to create these very complex wave fronts. This concludes the lecture on uniform plane waves and lossless media.